hey guys uh this one's gonna be unedited so i'm just gonna read it so if i make any mistakes that'll just be the way it is um this is the winged death by hp lovecraft and hazel healed hopefully he doesn't have any copyright claims on it because uh then this video will be down soon the orange hotel stands in high street near the railway station in Bloemfontein, south africa on Sunday, January 24th, 1932, four men sat shivering from terror in a room on its third floor. One was George C. Titteridge, proprietor of the hotel, and another was Police Constable Ian D. Witt of the Central Station. A third was Johannes Bogart, the local coroner. The fourth, and apparently the least disorganized of the group, was Dr. Cornelius Van Coolen, the coroner's physician. On the floor, uncomfortably evident, amidst the stifling summer heat, was the body of a dead man. But this was not what the four were afraid of. Their glances wandered from the table, on which lay a curious assortment of things, to the ceiling overhead, across whose smooth whiteness a series of huge, faltering alphabetical characters had somehow been scrawled in ink, and every now and then, Dr. Van Kulen would glance half fur furtively at a worn leather blank book, which he held in his left hand. The horror of the four seemed about equally divided among the blank book, the scrawled words on the ceiling, and a dead fly of peculiar aspect which floated in a bottle of ammonia on the table. Also on the table were an open ink well, a pen, and a writing pad, a physician's medical case, a bottle of a bottle of hydrochloric acid, and a tumbler about a quarter full of black oxide of manganese. The worn leather book was the journal of the dead man on the floor, and had at once made it clear that the name Frederick N. Mason, Mining Proprieties, Toronto, Canada, signed in the hotel register was a false one. There were other things, terrible things, which it likewise made clear, and still other things of far greater terror at which it hinted hideously, without making them clear or even fully believable. It was the half-belief of the four men fostered by the lives spent close to the black settled secrets of brooding Africa, which they made them shiver so violently in spite of the searing January heat. The blank book was not a large one, and the entries were in a fine handwriting, which however grew careless and a nervous looking toward the last. It consisted of a series of jottings at first rather irregularly spaced, but finally becoming daily. To call it a diary would not be quite correct, for it chronicled only one set of its writer's activities. Dr. Van Kulen recognized the name of the dead man the moment he opened the cover, for it was that of an eminent member of his own profession who had been largely connected with African matters. In another moment, he was horrified to find this name linked with a dastardly crime, officially unsolved, which had filled the newspaper some four months before, and farther he read and deeper grew his horror, awe, and sense of loathing and panic. Here, in essence, is the text which the doctor read aloud in that sinister and increasingly noisome room while the three men around him breathed hard, fidgeted in their chairs, and darted frightened glances at the ceiling, the table, the thing on the floor, and one another. Journal of Thomas Slaunwhite, Medical Doctor Touching punishment of Henry Sargent Moore, Ph.D. of Brooklyn, New York, professor of invertebrate biology in Columbia University. New York, N.Y., prepared to be read after my death for the satisfaction of making public the accomplishment of my revenge, which may otherwise never be imputed to me, even if it succeeds. January 5th, 1929. I have now fully resolved to kill Dr. Henry Moore, and, recent, and a recent incident has shown me how I shall do it. From now on, I shall follow a consistent line of action. Hence, the beginning of this journal. It is hardly necessary to repeat the circumstances which have driven me to this course, for the informed part of the public is familiar with all the salient facts. I was born in Trenton, New Jersey on April 12, 1885, the son of Dr. Paul Slonwhite, formerly of Pretoria, Transyal, South Africa. Studying medicine as part of my family tradition. I was led by my father, who died in 1916, while I was serving in a France, in France, in a South African regi regiment, to specialize in African fevers. 
and after my graduation from Colombia, spent much time in research, which took from Durban in Natal up to the equator itself. In Mombosa, I worked out my new theory of the transmission and development of remittent fever, aided only slightly by the people, papers of the late government physician Sir Norman Sloan, which I found in the house I occupied when I published my results. I became at a single stroke a famous authority. I was told of the probability of an almost supreme position in South African Health Service, and I even probable not, and even a probable knighthood. In the event of my becoming a naturalized citizen, according uh, and accordingly, I took the necessary state steps. Then occurred the incident for which I am about to kill Henry Moore. This man, my classmate, and a friend of years in America and Africa, chose deliberately to undermine my claim to my own theory, alleging that Sir Norman Sloan had anticipated me in every essential detail, and implying that I had probably found more of his papers than I had stated in my account of the matter. To buttress this absurd accusation, he produced certain personal letters from Sir Norman, which indeed shewed that the older man had been over my ground, and that he would have published his results very soon but for his sudden death. That much I could only admit with regret. What I could not ex excuse was the jealous suspicion that I had stolen the theory from Sir Norman's papers. The British government sensibly enough ignored these aspects but withheld but withheld that half promised appointment and knighthood on the ground that my theory while originally with me was not in fact new i could soon see that my career in africa was perceptibly checked though i had placed all my hopes in on such a career even to the point of resigning american citizenship a distinct coolness toward me had arisen among governments set in Mombosa, especially among those who had known Sir Norman. It was then that I resolved to be even with more sooner or later, though I did not know how. He he had been jealous of me. He had been jealous of my early celebrity, and taken advantage of his old correspondence with Sir Norman to ruin me. This from the friend whom I had myself led to take an interest in Africa whom I had coached and inspired till he achieved his present moderate fame as an authority of South African etymology. Even now, though, I will not deny that his attainments are profound. I made him, and in return he has ruined me. Now, some day, I shall destroy him. When I saw myself losing ground in Mombosa, I applied for my present situation in the interior at Mangonga, only 50 miles from the Uganda line. It is a cotton and ivory trading post with only eight white men besides myself a beastly hole almost on the equator and full of every sort of fever known to mankind poisonous snakes and insects everywhere and ninjas with diseases nobody ever heard of outside medical college but my work is not hard and i have always had plenty of time to plan things to do to henry moore it amuses me to give his Terra of Central and South Southern Africa a prominent place on my shelf. I suppose it actually is a standard manual. They use it at Col Columbia, Harvard, and the U of WIS, but my own suggestions are really responsible for half its strong points. Last week I encountered the thing which decided me how to kill more. A party from Uganda brought in a black with a queer illness, which I can't yet diagnose. He was lethargic with a very low temperature, and shuffled in a peculiar way. Most of the others were afraid of him and said he was under some kind of witch doctor spell, but Gobo, the interpreter, said he had been bitten by an insect. What it was I can't imagine, for there is only a slight puncture on his arm. It is, a, it is bright red, though with a purple ring around it, spectral looking. I don't wonder the boys lay it to black magic. They seem to have seen cases like it before, and say there really is nothing to do about it. Old Nakuru, one of the gala boys at the post, says it must be the bite of a devil fly, which makes its victim waste away gradually and die, and then takes hold of his soul and personality if it is still alive itself, flying around with all his likes, dislikes, and consciousness. A queer legend, and I don't know of any local insect deadly enough to account for it. I give this sick black his name is Mavenna a good shot of quinine and take a sample of his blood for testing but haven't made s much progress 
There's is certainly a strange germ present, but I can't even remotely identify it. The nearest thing to it is the bacillus one finds in oxen, horses, and dogs that the testi fly has bitten. But testi flies don't infect human beings, and this is too far north for, for them anyway. However, the important thing is that I've decided how to kill more. If the interior region has insects as poisonous as natives say, I'll see that he gets a shipment from them from a source he won't suspect, and with plenty of assurances that they are harmless. Trust him to throw overboard all caution, and when it comes to studying an unknown species, and then we'll see how the nature takes its course. It ought not to be hard to find an insect that scares the blacks so much, first to see how poor Mavenna turns out, and then to find my envoy of death. January 7th. Mavenna is no better. Though I have injected all the antitoxins I know of, he has fits of trembling in which he rants affrightedly about the way his soul will pass when he dies into the insect that bit him. But between them, he remains in a kind of half-stupor, heart action still strong, so I may pull him through. I shall try to, for he can probably guide me better than anyone else to the region where he was bitten. Meanwhile, I'll write to Dr. Lincoln, my predecessor here. For Alan, the head factor says he had a profound knowledge of the local sickness. He ought to know about the death fly if any white man does. He's at Narrabo now, and a black runner ought to get me a reply in a week, using the railway for half the trip. January 10th. January 10th. Patient, unchanged, but I have found what I want. It was in an old volume of the local health records, which I've been going over diligently while waiting to hear from Lincoln. Thirty years ago, there was an epidemic that killed off thousands of natives in Uganda, and it was definitely traced to a rare fly called Glossina palpalis, a sort of cousin to the Glossina marcitinus, or testesi. It lives in the bush on the shores of lakes and rivers, and feeds on the blood of crocodiles, antelopes, and large mammals. When these food animals have the germ of triponosomosis, or sleeping sickness, it picks it up and develops acute infectively infectivity after an incub incubation period of 31 days then for 75 days it is sure death to anyone or anything it bites without a, without doubt this must be the devil fly the ninjas talk about now i know what i'm heading for now i know what i'm heading for hope mavenna pulls through ought to hear from lincoln in four or five days he has a great reputation for success and things like this my worst problem will be to get flies to more without his recognizing them. With this cursed plotting scholarship, it would be just like him to know all about them since they're actually on record. January 15th. Just heard from Lincoln who confirms that all the records say that the Glossania papalis say about Glossania papalis. He has a remedy for sleeping sickness, which has succeeded in a great number of cases when not given too late. Intermuscular injections of triparasamide since Mavenna has bitten about two months ago. I don't know how it will work, but Lincoln says that cases have been known to drag on 18 months, so probably, possibly, I'm not too late. Lincoln said over some of his stuff, so I've just given Mavenna a stiff shot and a super now. They've, bought, they've brought his principal wife from the village, but he doesn't even recognize her. If he recovers, he can certainly shoo me where the flies are. He's a great crocodile hunter, according to report, and knows all Uganda like a book. I'll give him another shot tomorrow. January 16th. Mavenna seems to be a little brighter today, but his heart action is slowing up a bit. I'll keep up the injections, but not overdo them. January 17th. Recovery, really pronounced today. Mavenna opened his eyes and shooned sights of actual consciousness, though dazed, after the injection, Hope Moore doesn't know about tripyramicide. There's a good chance he won't, since he never leaned much toward medicine. Mavenna's tongue seemed paralyzed, but I fancy that will pass if, off if I can only wake him. Wouldn't mind a good sleep myself, but not of this kind. January 25th. Mavenna nearly cured. In another week, I can let him take me into the jungle. He was frightened when he first came to about having the fly take him take his personality after he died, but brightened up finally when I told him he was going to get well. His wife Ugawai took takes good care of him now, and I can rest a bit. Then for the envoys of death. Mavenna is well now, and I have talked to him talked with him 
about a hunt for flies. He dreads to go near that place where they got him, but I am playing on his gratitude. Besides, he has an idea that I can ward off disease as well as cure it. His pluck would shame a white man. There's no doubt that he'll go. I can get off by telling the head factor that the trip is in the interest of local work, health work. March 12th. In Uganda at last. Have five boys besides Mavena, but they are all Galas. The local blacks couldn't be hired to come near the region after the talk of what happened in Mavana. This jungle is a pestil place. Pestil, pestilental place. Streaming with miasmal vapors, all the lakes look stagnant in one spot. We come upon the trace of cyclopean ruins, which made every Gallus run past in a wild circle. They say these megaliths are older than man, and that they used to be a haunt or outpost of the fishers from outside, whatever that means, and the evil gods Tassadagoa and Kalulu. To this day they are said to have a malign influence and to be connected somehow with the devil flies. March 15th. Struck Lake Malo Malolo this morning where Mavana was bitten. A hellish green scummed affair full of crocodiles. Mavana has a fixed up has fixed up a fly trap of fine wire netted, netting baited with crocodile meat. It has a small entrance and once a, the quarry got in, they don't know if to they don't know enough to get out. As, as as stupid as they are deadly and ravenous for fresh meat or a bowl of blood, hope we can get a good supply. I've decided that I must experiment with them finding a way to change their appearance so that more won't recognize them. Possibly I can cross them with some other species producing a strange hybrid whose infection carrying capacity will be undiminished. We'll see. I must wait, but I am in no hurry now. When I get ready, I'll have Mavana get me some infected meat to feed my envoys of death. And then for the post office, ought to be no trouble getting infection, for his country is a veritable pest hole. For this country is a veritable pest hole. March 16th. Good luck. Two cages full, five vigorous specimens with wings glistening like diamonds. Mavena is emptying them into a large can with a tightly meshed top, and I think we caught them in the nick of time. We can get them to Magogun, Magonga without trouble, talking plenty of crocodile, taking plenty of crocodile meat for their food. Undoubtedly, all or most of it is infected. April 20th. Back at Magonga and busy in the laboratory, has sent to Dr. Juiced in Petoria for some tetesi flies for hybridization experiments. Such a crossing, if it will work at all, ought to produce something pretty hard to recognize, yet at the same time just as deadly as the palpalis. If this doesn't work, I shall try certain other diptera from the interior, and I haven't set to Dr. Van Delved of at Ningoye for some of some of the Congo types. I shan't have to send Mervana for more tainted meat after all, for I find I can keep cultures of germ Tyramponsomia gambonese taken from the meat we got last month, almost indefinitely in tubes when the time comes. I'll taint some fresh meat and feed my, wing, and feed my winged envoys a, do, a good dose, then bon voyage to them. June 18th. My tetesi flies from juice came today. Cages for breeding were already long ago, and I am now making selections intended to use ultraviolet rays to speed up the life cycle. Fortunately, I have the needed apparatus in my regular equipment. Naturally, I tell no one what I'm doing. The ignorance of the few men here makes it easy for me to conceal my aims and pretend to be, a merely, to be merely studying existing species for medical reasons. The crossing is fertile. Good deposits of eggs last Wednesday, and I have some excellent larvae. If the mature insects look as strange as these do, I need to do nothing more. I am preparing separate numbered cages for the different specimens. New hybrids are out. Disguise is excellent as to shape, but sheen of wings still suggests palipalis, thorax has faint suggestions of the stripes of the testesi. Slight variations in the individuals am feeding them all on tainted crocodile meat, and after infective infectivity develops, 
We'll try them on some of the blacks. Apparently, of course, by accident, there are so many mind, mildly venomous flies around here that I can easily that it can be easily done without exciting suspicion. I shall lose an insect in my tightly screened dining room when Bada, my houseboy, brings in breakfast. Keeping well on guard myself when it has done its work, I'll capture or swat it. On e an easy thing because of, the, because of its stupidity, uh, asphyxiate it by filling the room with chlorine gas. If it doesn't work the first time, I'll try again until it does. Of course, I'll have the triparasamide handy in case I get bitten myself, but I shall be careful to avoid biting, for no antidote is really certain. August 10th. Infectivity. Mature and manage to get Bada stung in fine shape. Caught the fly on him, returning it to its cage. Eased up the pain with iodine, and the poor devil is quite grateful for all the service. Shall try a variant specimen on Gamba, the factor's messenger, tomorrow. That will be all the tests I shall dare to make here, but if I need more, I shall take some specimens to Ukala and get additional data. August 11th. Failed to get Gamba, but recaptured the fly alive. Bada still seems as well as usual and has no pain in the back where he was stung. Shall wait before trying to get Gamba again. August 14th. Shipment of insects from Van Vanderveld at last. Final fully seven distinct species. Some more or less poisonous. Am keeping them well fed in case the Tetesi crossing doesn't work. Some of these fellows look very unlike the Palpalis, but in the trouble is that they might not make a fertile cross with it. August 17th. Got Gamba this afternoon, but had to kill the fly on him. It nipped him in the left shoulder. I dressed the bite, and Gamba is as grateful as Bada was. No change in Bada. August 20th. Gamba unchanged so far. Bada too. I'm experimenting with a new form of disguise to supplement the hybridization. Some sort of dye to change the telltale glitter of the papalis wings. A bluish tint would be best something would be best. Something I could spray on a whole batch of insects shall begin by investigating things like Prussian and Turnbull's blue, iron, and cyanogen salts. Bada complained of a pain in his back today. Things may be developing. September 13th. Have made fair progress in my experience. Bada shows, shows signs of lethargy and says his back aches all the time. Gamba beginning to feel uneasy in his bitten shoulder. September 24th. Bada worse and worse, and beginning to get frightened about his bite, thinks it must be a devil fly, and entreated me to kill it, for he saw me cage it, until I pretend to him that it had been that it had died long ago, said he didn't want his soul to pass into it upon his death. I gave him shots of plain water with a hypodermic to keep his morale up. Evidently the fly retains all the properties of the papalis. Gamba down too, and repeating all of them. Bada's symptoms. I may decide to give him a chance with the tripalsamide, for the effect of the fly is provided well enough. I shall let Bada go on, however, for I want a rough idea of how long it takes to finish a case. Die experiments coming along finely, and in in <laughs> an iso iso isomeric form of ferrous ferrocyanide with some admixture of potassium salts, can be dissolved in alcohol and sprayed on the insects with splendid effect. It stains the wings blue without affecting the dark thorax much, and doesn't wear off when I sprinkle the specimens with water. With the disguise, I think I can use the present testesi hybrids and avoid bothering with any more experiments. Sharp as he is, Moore couldn't recognize a blue-winged fly with half a testesi thorax. Of course, I keep all his dye business strictly undercover, Nothing must ever connect me with the blue flies later on. October 9th. Bada is lethargic and has taken to his bed. He has been given Gamba tri... He have been giving Gamba triparasamide for two weeks and fancy he'll recover. Bada very low and Gamba nearly well. Bada died yesterday and a curious thing happened which gave me a real shiver in view of the na native legends and Bada's own fears. When I returned to the library after laboratory after his death, I heard the most singular buzzing and thrashing in Cage 12, which contained the fly that bit Bada. The creature seemed frantic, but stopped still when I appeared, lighting on the wire netting and looking at me in the oddest way. It reached its legs through the wires as if it were bewil bewildered. 
When I came back from the dining with Alan, the thing was dead. Evidently, it had gone wild and beaten its life out on the sides of the cages. On the side of the cage. It certainly is peculiar that this should happen just as Bada died. If any black had seen it, he'd have laid it at once to the absorption of the poor devil's soul. I shall start my blue-stained hybrids on their way before long now. The hybrids' rate of killing seems a little ahead of the pure papalis rate. If anything, Bada died three months ago and eight days after infection. But of course, there is always a wide margin of uncertainty. I almost wish I had let Gamba's case run on. December 5th. Busy planning how to get my envoys to more. I must have them appear to come from some disinterested etymologist who has read his Diptera of Central and Southern Africa and believes he would like to study this new and undi unidentifiable species. There must also be ample assurances that the blue-winged fly is harmless, as pr proved by the natives' long experience. More will be off his guard, and one of the flies will surely get him sooner or later. Though, one can't tell just when. I'll have to rely on the letters of New York friends. They still speak of more from time to time to keep me informed of early results. Though I dare say the papers will announce his death above all, I must show no interest in this case. I shall mail the flags while on a trip, but must not be recognized when I do it. The best plan will be to take a long vacation in the interior, grow a beard, mail the package at Ucala while passing as a visiting etymologist, and return here after shaving off the beard. April 12, 1930. Back in Magonga after my long trip. Everything has come off finally with clockwork precision. I've sent the flies to Moore without leaving a trace. Got a Christmas vacation December 15th and set out at once with proper stuff. Made a very good mailing container with room to include some germ-tainted crocodile meat as food for the envoys. By the end of February, I heard beard enough. I had beard enough to shape into a close Van Dyke. Shoot up at Ukala March 9th and typed a letter to Moore on the trading post machine. Signed in Neville Wayland Hall. Supposed to be an etymologist from London. Think I took just the right tone. Interest of a brother scientist and all that. Was artistically casual in emphasizing the complete harmlessness of the specimens. Nobody suspected anything. Shaved the beard as soon as I hit the bush. So that there wouldn't be any uneven tanning by the time I got back here. Dispensed with native bears except for one small stretch of swamp I can... I can do wonders with one knapsack, and my sense of direction is good. Luckily, lucky I'm used to such traveling, explained my protracted absence by pleading a touch of fever and some mistakes in direction when going through the bush. But now comes the hardest part. Psychologically waiting for news of more without shooing the strain. Of course, he may possibly escape a bite until the venom is played out, but with his recklessness... The chances are 100 to 1 against him. I have, I have no regrets after what he did to me. He deserves this and more. June 30th, 1930. Hoorah! The first step worked. I just heard casually from Dyson of Columbia that Moore had received some new blue-winged flies from Africa and that he is badly puzzled over them. No word of any bite. But if I know Moore's slipshod ways, as I think I do, there'll be one more, one before long. August 27th, 1930. Letter from Morton in Cambridge. He says Moore writes of feeling very run down and tells of an insect bite on his back of its neck. From a curious new specimen that he received about the middle of June. Have I succeeded, apparently? Have I succeeded? Apparently Moore doesn't connect the bite with his weakness. If this is the real stuff, then Moore was bitten well with the insect's period of infectivity. September 12th, 1930. Victory! Another line from Dyson says that the moor is really in an alarming shape. He now traces his illness to the bite which he recovered, which he received around noon on June 19th, and is quite bewildered about the identity of the insect. He's trying to get in touch with Neville Wayland Hall, who sent him the shipment. Of the hundred odd that I sent him, about 25 seem to have reached him, alive. So some escaped at the time of the bite, but several larvae have appeared from eggs laid since the time of mailing. He is Dyson. He is 
Dyson says, carefully incubating these larvae. When they mature, I suppose he'll identify the testesi papalis hybridization, but that won't do him much good now. He'll wonder, though, why the blue wings aren't transmitted by heredity. <laughs> November 8, 1930. Letters from half a dozen friends tell of more serious illness. Dyson's came today. He says more is utterly at sea about the hybrids that came from the larvae and is beginning to think that the parents got their blue wings in some artificial way. Has to say, stay in bed most of the time. Now, no mention of using triparasomide. February 13th, 1931. Not so good. More is sinking and seems to know no remedy, but I think he suspects me. Had a very chilly letter from Morton last month, which told nothing of more, and now Dyson writes, also other, rather constrainedly, that Moore is forming theories about the whole matter, and other places, and of course finds nothing. I judge that he's told Dyson whom he suspects, but that Dyson doesn't believe it yet. Fear Morton does believe it. I see that I'd better lay plans for getting out of here and effacing my identity for good. What an advance. What an end to a career that started out so well. More of Moore's work, but this time he's paying for it in advance. Believe I'll go back to South Africa, and meanwhile, while quietly depositing, while quietly deposit funds there to the credit of my new self, Frederick Nasmith, Mason of Toronto, Canada, broker in mining properties. Well, we'll establish, we'll establish a new signature for identification. If I never have to take the step, I can easily retransfer the funds to my present self. August fifteenth, nineteen thirty-one. Half a year is go half a year gone, and still suspense. Dyson and Morton, as well as several of their friends, seem to have stopped writing me. Doctor James of San Francisco hears from Moore's friends now and then, and says Moore is in an almost continuous coma. He hasn't been able to walk since May. As long as he could talk, he complained of being cold. Now he can't talk, though it is thought he still has glimmers of consciousness. His breathing is short and quick and can be heard some distance away. No question but the Trypanosoma gambis is feeding on him. But he holds out better than the ninjas around here. Three months and eight days finished Bata, and here Moore is alive over half a year after his biting. Heard rumors last month of an intense search around Ukala for Wayland Hall. Don't think I need to worry yet, though, for there's absolutely nothing in existence to link me with this business. October 7th, 1931. It's over at last. News in, news in the Mombosa Gazette. Moore died September 20th after a series of trembling fits and with a temperature vastly below normal. So much for that, I said. I'd get him, and I did. The paper had a three-column report of his long illness and death and of the futile search for Wayland Hall. Obviously, Moore was a bigger character in Africa than I had realized. The inf insect that bit him has now been fully identified from the surviving specimens and developed larvae, and the wing staining is also detected. It is universally realized that the flies were prepared and shipped with the intent to kill Moore. It appears communicated certain suspicions to Dyson that the latter and the police are maintaining secrecy because of absence of proof all of Moore's enemies are being looked up. An Associated Press hints that the, an investigation possibly involving an eminent physician now abroad will follow. One thing at the very end of the report. Undoubtedly, the cheap romancing of a yellow journalist gives me a curious shudder in the view of the legends of the blacks and the way the fly happened to go wild when Bata died. It seems that an odd incident occurred on the night of Moore's death, Dyson having been aroused by the buzzing of a blue-winged fly, which immediately flew out the window. But what the what concerns me most is the African end of the matter. People at Ukala remember the bearded stranger who typed the letter and sent the package, and the constabulary are combing the country for any blacks who may have carried him. I didn't use many, but if officers question the Ubandes who took me through Nkine jungle, Belt, I'll have more to explain than I like. It looks as if the time has come for me to vanish, so tomorrow I believe I'll resign and prepare to start for parts unknown. November 9th, 1931. Hard work getting my registration acted on, but release came today. I didn't want to aggravate suspicion by decamping outright. Last week I heard from James about Moore's death, but nothing more than is in the papers. 
those around him in New York seem rather reticent about details, though they all talk about a searching investigation. No word from any of my friends in the East. Moore must have spread some dangerous suspicion around before he lost consciousness. But there isn't an iota of proof he couldn't have adduced. He could have adduced. Still, I am taking no chances. On Thursday, I shall start for Mombosa, and that when there, we'll take a streamer down the coast to Durban. After that, I shall drop from sight, but soon a, afterward, the mining properties broker Frederick Nasmith Mason from Toronto will turn up in Johannesburg. Let this be the end of my journal. If in the end I am not suspected, it will serve its original purpose after my death, and real what, reveal what would otherwise not be known. If, on the other hand, these suspicions do materialize on, and persist, it will confirm the clarity, clarify the vague charges and fill in many important and puzzling gaps. Of course, if danger comes my way, I shall have to destroy it. Well, Moore is dead, as he amply deserves to be. Now, Dr. Thomas Sloan White is dead, too. And when the body formerly belonging to Thomas Sloan White is dead, the public may have this record. January 15th, 1932. A new year and a reluctant reopening of this journal. This time I am writing solely to relieve my mind, for it would be absurd to fancy that the case is not definitely closed. I am settled in the Val Hotel, Johannesburg, under my new name, and no one has so far challenged my identity. Have had some inclusive business talks to keep up my part as a mine broker and believe I may actually work myself into the business. Later I shall go to Toronto and plant a few evidences for my fictitious past. But what is bothering me is an insect that invaded my room around noon today. Of course I have had all sorts of nightmares about blue flies of late, but these were only to be expected in view of my prevailing nervous strain. This thing, however, was waking actually. This thing, however, was waking actuality, and I'm utterly at a loss to account for it. It buzzed around my bookshelf for fully a quarter of an hour, and eluded every attempt to catch or kill it. The queerest thing was its color and aspect, for it had blue wings and was in every way a duplicate of my hybrid envoys of death. How, uh, how it could possibly be one of these, in fact, I certainly don't know. I disposed of all the hybrids. Stained and unstained that I didn't send him more and I can't recall any instance of escape Can this be wholly a hallucination or could any of the specimens that escaped in Brooklyn when Moore was bitten have found their way back to Africa? There was that absurd story of the blue fly that waked Dyson when Moore died But after all the survival and return of some of the things is not impossible it perfectly plausible that the blue fly it is perfectly plausible that the blue should stick to their wings too for the pigment I only rationally ex the only rational explanation for this thing. Though it is very curious that the fellow has come as far south as this. Possibly it is some heredity homing instinct inherent to its testesy strain. After all that side of him belongs to South Africa. I must be on my guard against a bite. Of course the original venom, if this is actually one of the flies that escaped from Moor, was worn out ages ago, but the fellow must have fed as he flew back from America, and he may well have come through Central Africa and picked up a freshly infective, and a fresh infectivity. Indeed, that's more probable than not. For for the papalis, half of his heredity would naturally take him back to Uganda, and all trypanosomiasis germs. I still have some of the tripersomide left. I couldn't bear to destroy my medicine case, incriminating though it may be, but since reading up on the subject I am not so sure about the drug's action as I was. It gives one a fighting chance, certainly it saved Gamba, but there, there's always a large probability of failure. It's devilish, que it's devilish queer that this fly should have happened to come into my room, of all places, in the white expanse of Africa. Seems a strange coincidence to the breaking point. I suppose that if it comes again, I shall certainly kill it. I'm surprised that it escaped me today, for ordinarily these fellows are extremely stupid and easy to catch. Can it be pure illusion after all? Certainly the heat is getting to me of late, as it never did before, even up around Uganda. January 16th. Am I going insane? 
The flight came again this noon, and acted so anomalously that I can't make head or tail of it. Only delusion on my part could account for what the puzzling pet, what that buzzing pest seemed to do. It appeared from nowhere and went straight to my bookshelf, circling again and again in front of the copy of Morris Diptera of Central and South Southern Africa. Now and then it would light on top of a on top or back of the volume, and occasionally it would dart forward toward me in a cheat before I could strike at it with a folded paper. Such cunning is unheard of among the notorious stupid African Diptera. For nearly half an hour I tried to get the cursed thing, but at last it darted out the window through a hole in the screen that I hadn't noticed. At times I fancied it deliberately mocked me by coming within reach of my weapon and then skillfully sidestepping as I struck out. I must keep a tight hold of my consciousness. January 17th. Either I am mad, or the world is in the grip of sudden suspension of the laws of probability as we know them. That damnable fly came in from somewhere just before noon, and commenced buzzing around the copy of Moore's Diptera on my shelf. Again I tried to catch it, and again yesterday's experience was repeated. Finally the pest made for the open inkwell on my table, and dipped itself in just the leg and thorax, keeping its wings clear. Then it sailed up to the ceiling, and... And lit beginning to crawl around in a curved patch and leaving a trail of ink. After time, it hopped on. After time, it hopped a bit and made a single ink spot unconnected with the trail. Then it dropped squarely in front of my face and buzzed out of sight before I could get it. Something about this whole business struck me as monstro monstrously sinister and abnormal, more so than I could explain to myself. When I looked at the ink trail on the ceiling from different angles, it seemed more and more familiar to me, and it dawned on me suddenly that it formed an absolutely perfect question mark. What device could be more malignly appropriate? It is a, it is a wonder that I did not faint so far that the ho so far the hotel atten attendants have not noticed it, have not seen the fly this afternoon, and evening. But I am keeping it my inkwell securely closed. I think my extermination of more must be preying on me and giving me morbid hallucinations. Perhaps there is no fly at all. January 18th. Into what strange hell of living nightmare am I plunged? What occurred today is something which could not normally happen, and yet a hotel attendant has seen the marks on the ceiling and concedes their reality. About 11 o'clock this morning, as I was writing as I was writing on a manuscript, something darted down to the inkwell for a second and flashed aloft again before I could see what it was. Looking up, I saw the hellish fly on the ceiling as it had been before, crawling along and tracing another trail of curves and turns. There was nothing I could do, but I folded a newspaper in readiness to get the creature if it should fly near enough. When it, when it had made several turns on the ceiling, it flew into a dark corner and disappeared. As soon as I looked upward at the dubly faced plastering, I saw that the new ink trail was that of a huge and unmistakable figure five. For a time, I was almost unconscious from a wave of nameless menace for which I could not fully account. Then I summoned up my resolution and took an active step. Going out to a chemist's shop, I purchased some gum and other things necessary for preparing a sticky trap. Also a duplicate inkwell. Returning to my room, I filled the new inkwell with sticky mixture and set it where the old one had been, leaving it open, and then I tried to concentrate my mind on some reading about three o'clock. I heard, I heard the accursed insect again and saw it circling around my new inkwell. It descended to the sticky surface but did not touch it, and afterwards sailed straight toward me, retreating before I could hit it. That it went to the bookshelf and circled around Moore's treatise. There is something profound and diabolic about the way that intruder hovers near that book. The worst part was the last leaving, was the last. Leaving Moore's book, the insect flew over to the open window and began beating itself rhythmically against the wire screen. There would be a series of beats, and then a series of equal length, and another pause, and so on. Something about this performance held me motionless for a couple of moments, but after that, I went over to the window and tried to kill the noxious thing. As usual, no use, it merely flew across the room to a lamp and began beating the ta same tattoo on the stiff, cardboard shade. I felt a vague desperation and proceeded to shut all the doors as well as the window whose screen I had the impeccab impeccability, imp imperceptible hole. It seemed very necessary to kill this persistent being whose hounding was rapidly unseating my mind. Then unconsciously counting, I began to notice that each of its series of beatings contained just five strokes. Five, the same number that that thing had traced in ink on the ceiling in the morning. 
Could there be an in, could there be a conceivable connection? The notion was maniacal, for that would argue a human intellect and a knowledge of written figures in the hybrid fly. A human intellect did not take one back to the most primitive legends of the Uganda blacks, and yet there was that infernal cleverness in eluding me as contrasted with the normal stupidity of the breed. As I laid aside from my folded paper and sat down in growing horror, the insect buzzed aloft and disappeared through a hole in the ceiling, where the radiator pipe went to the room above. The departure did not soothe me, for my mind had started on a train of wild and terrible reflections. If this fly and a hum had a human intelligence, where did the intelligence come from? Was there any truth in it? The native notion that these creatures acquire the personality of their victims after the latter's death? If so, whose personality did this fly bear? I had reasoned out that it must be one of those which escaped from Moore at the time he was bitten. Was this envoy of death which had bitten Moore? If so, what did it want with me? What did it want with me anyway? In a cold in a cold perspiration, I remembered the actions of the fly that had bitten Bada when Bada died. Had its own personality been displaced by that of its dead victim? Then there was the, that sensational news account of the fly that wiped Dyson when Moore died. As for the fly that was hounding me, could it be that a vindictive human personality drove it on? How it hovered around Moore's book. I refused to think any farther than that. All at once I began to feel sure that the creature was indeed infected, and in the most virulent way, with a malign deliberation so evident in fact, it must surely have charged itself on purpose with the deadliest bacilli in all Africa. My mind thoroughly shaken was now taken the thing's human qualities for granted. I now telephoned the clerk and asked for a man to stop up the radiator pipe hole and other possible chinks in my room. I spoke of being tormented by flies, and he seemed to be quite sympathetic. When the man came, I shewn him the ink marks on the ceiling, which he recognized without difficulty. So they are real. The resemblance to a question mark and a, and a figure five puzzled and fascinated him. In the end, he, he stopped up the holes he couldn't find and mended the window screen so that I can now keep both windows open. He evidently thought me a bit eccentric, especially since no insects were in sight while he was there. But I am pasting, I am past minding that. So far the fly has not appeared this evening. God knows what it is, what it wants, or what it will, what will become of me. January 19th. I am utterly engulfed in horror. The thing has touched me. Something monstrous and demonic is at work around me, and I am a helpless victim. In the morning when I returned from breakfast, that winged fiend from hell brushed into the room over my head and began beating itself against the window screen as it did yesterday. This time, though, each series of beats contained only four strokes. I rushed to the window and tried to catch it, but it escaped as usual and flew over to Moore's Treatise, where it buzzed around mockingly. Its vocal equipment is limited, but I noticed that its spells of buzzing came in groups of four. By this time, I was certainly mad, for I called out to Moore, more, more for God's sake, what do you want? When I did so, the creature suddenly ceased its circling, flew toward me and made a low, graceful dip in the air, somehow suggestive of a bow. Then it flew back to the book. At least I seemed to see it do all this, though I am trusting my senses no longer. And then the worst thing happened. I had left my door open, hoping the monster would leave if I could not catch it. But at about 11.30, I shut the door, concluding it had gone, and I settled down to read. Just as noon... I felt it I felt a tickling on my on the back of my neck, but when I put my hand up, nothing was there. In a moment I felt the tickling again, and before I could move the nameless spawn of hell sailed into the view from behind, did another of those mocking graceful dips in the air and flew out through the keyhole, which I had never dreamed was large enough to allow its passage. That the thing had touched me I could no doubt. It had touched me without injuring me, and then I remembered in a sudden cold fright that Moore had been bitten on the back of the neck at noon. No invasion since then, but I have stuffed all the keyholes with paper and shall have a folded paper ready for use whenever I open the door to leave or enter. I cannot yet believe fully in the supernatural, yet I fear none the less that I am lost. The business is too much for me. Just before noon today, that devil appeared outside the window and repeated its beating operations, but this time in series of three. When I went to the window, it flew off out of sight. I still have resolution enough to take one more defensive step. Removing both window screens, I coated them with my sticky preparation, the one I used in the inkwell outside, the in, outside and inside, and set them back in place. 
If the creature attempts another tattoo, it will be its last. Rest of the day in peace. Can I weather this experience without being becoming a maniac? January 21st. On board train for Bloom Fountain. I am routed. The thing is winning. It has a diabolic intelligence against which all my devices are powerless. It appeared outside the window this morning, but did not touch the sticky screen. Instead, it sheared off without lighting and began buzzing around in circles, two at a time. Followed by a pause in the air, after several of these performances, it flew out of the sight over the roofs of the city. My nerves are just about at the breaking point, for these suggestions of numbers are capable of hideous interpretation. Monday the thing dwelt on the figure five. Tuesday it was four. Wednesday was three. And now today is two. Four, five, four, three, two, what? Can this be some... Can this be save some monstrous and unthinkable counting of days? For what purpose? Only the evil powers of the universe can know. I spent all afternoon packing and arranging about my trunks, and now I have taken the night express for Bloom Fountain. Fight, flight might be, may be useless, but what else can I one do? January 22nd. Settled at the Orange Hotel. Bloom Fountain, a, a comfortable and excellent place. But the horror followed me. I had shut all the doors and windows, stopped all the keyholes, looked for any possible chinks, and pulled down all the shades. But just before noon, I heard a dull tap on one of the window screens. I waited, and after a long pause, another tap came. A second pause, and still a large, slow circle in the air, and then flew out of sight. I was left as weak as a rag, and had to rest on the couch. 1. This was clearly the burden of the monster's present message. One tap, one circle... Did this mean one more day before me, before for, one day for me, before some unthinkable doom? Ought I to flee again or entrench myself here by sealing up the room? After an hour's rest, I felt able to act and ordered a large reserve supply of canned and packaged food, also linen and towels sent in. Tomorrow I should not, under any circumstance, open any crevice or door or window. When the food and linen came up, the black looked at me queerly, but I no longer care how eccentric or insane I may appear. I am hounded by powers worse than the ridicule of mankind. Having received my supplies, I went over every square millimeter of the walls and stopped up every microscopic opening I could find. At least I feel able to get real sleep. Handwriting here becomes irregularly... Handwriting here becomes irregular, nervous, and very difficult to decipher. January 23rd. It's just before noon, and I feel that something very terrible is about to happen. Didn't sleep as late as I expected, even though I got almost no sleep on the train the night before. Up early, and have had trouble getting concentrated on anything. Reading or writing, that slow, deliberate counting of off of days is too much for me. I don't know which has gone wild, nature or my head, until about 11. I did very little except walk up and down the room. And then I heard a rustle among the food packages brought in yesterday, and that demonic fly crawled out before my eyes. I grabbed something flat and made passes at the thing despite my panic fear, but with no more effect than usual, I advanced that blue-winged horror retreated as usual to the table where I had piled my books and lit for a second on Moore's Terror of Central and Southern Africa. Then as I followed, it flew over to the mantel clock and lit on a dial near the figure 12. Before I could think up another move, it had begun to crawl around the dial very slowly and deliberately in the direction of the hands. It passed under the minute hand, curved down and up, passed under the hour hand, and finally came to a stop exactly at the figure 12. As it hovered there, it fluttered its wings with a buzzing noise. Is this a portent of some sort? I'm getting as superstitious as the blacks. The hour is now a little after 11. Is 12 the end? I have just one last resort brought to my mind through utter desperation. Wish I had thought of it before. Recalling that my medicine case contains both of the substances necessary to generate chlorine gas, I resolved to fill the room with that lethal vapor asphyxiating the fly while protecting myself with an ammonia-sealed handkerchief tied over my face. Fortunately, I have a good supply of ammonia. This crude mask will probably neutralize the acrid chlorine fumes so the insect is dead, or at least helpless enough to crush. But I must be quick. How can I be sure that the thing will not suddenly dart for me before my preparations are complete? I ought not to be stopping to write in this journal. Later, both chemicals, hydrochloric acid and manganese dioxide, on the table all ready to, be, all ready to mix, I've tied the handkerchief over my nose and mouth and have a bottle of ammonia, ready to keep it soaked until the chlorine, gas, chlorine is gone. Have battened down both windows, but I don't like the actions of that hybrid daemon. 
It stays on the clock, but is very slowly crawling around backward from the 12 mark to meet the gradual advancing minute hand. Is this to be my last entry in this journal? It would be useless to try to deny what I suspect to often a gain of incredible truth lurks behind the wildest and most fantastic of legends. Is the per is the personality of Henry Moore trying to get me through this blue-winged devil? Is this the fly that bit him and that in consequence absorbed his consciousness when he died? If so, and if it bites me, will my own personality display some mores and enter the buzzing body when I die of the bite later on? Perhaps, though I need not die, even if it gets me. There's always a chance with triparamicide that I regret nothing. More had to die, but the outcome, what it will. Slightly later, the fly has paused on the clock dial near the 45 minute mark. It is now 11.30. I am saturating the handkerchief over my face with ammonia and keeping the bottle handy for further applications. This will be the final entry before I mix the acid and manganese. And, liber and liberate the chlorine, I ought not to be losing time, but it steadies me to get things down on paper. But for this record, I have lost all my reason long ago. The fly seems to be getting restless, and the minute hand is approaching it now. And approaching it. Now for the chlorine. End of the journal. On Sunday, January 24th, 1932, after repeated knocking had failed to gain any response from the eccentric man in room 303 of the Orange Hotel, a black attendant entered with a passkey and at once fled, shrieking downstairs to tell the clerk what he had found. The clerk, after notifying the police, summoned the manager, and later accompanied Constable D. Witt, Coroner Borgat, Borgat and Dr. Van Coolen to the fatal room. The document lay dead on the floor, his face upward and bound with a handkerchief which smelled strongly of ammonia. Under, his, under this covering, the features showed an expression of stark, utter fear which transmitted itself to the observers on the back of the neck of Dr. Van Coolen found a virulent insect bite, dark red with a purple ring around it, which suggested a tatesi fly or something less innocuous. An examination indicated that the death must be due to heart failure induced by sheer fright rather than to the bite, though a subsequent autopsy indicated that the germ of Tripanthinomosis had been introduced to the system. On the table were several objects: a worn leather blank book containing the journal just described, a pen, writing pad, an open inkwell, a doctor's medicine case with the initials T S, marked in gold, bottles of ammonia and hydrochloric acid, and a tumbler about a quarter full of black manganese dioxide. The ammonia, bo the ammonia bottle demanded a second look because something besides the fluid seemed to be in it. Looking closer, Coroner Borgott saw that the alien occupant was a fly. It seemed to be some sort of hybrid with vague testesi affiliations, but its wings soon faintly blue despite the actions of the strong ammonia were a complete puzzle. Something about it waked a faint memory of newspaper reading in Dr. Van Coolen, a memory which the journal was soon to confirm. Its lower parts seemed to have been stained with ink, so thoroughly that even the ammonia had not bleached them. Possibly it had fallen at one time into an inkwell, though the wings were untouched. But how had it managed to fall into the narrow necked ammonia bottle? It was as if the creature had deliberately crawled in and committed suicide. But the strangest thing of all was that Constable DeWitt noticed on the smooth white ceiling overhead his eyes roved about curiously at his cry. His eyes roved about curiously. At his cry, the other three followed his gaze. Even Dr. Van Coolen, who had for some time been thumbing through the worn leather book with an expression of mixed horror, fascination, and incredulity. The thing on the ceiling was a series of shaky, straggling ink tracks. Such might have been made by the crawling of some ink-drenched insect. At once, every thought of the strains on the fly so oddly found in the ammonia bottle. But these were no ordinary ink tracks. Even a first glance revealed something hauntingly familiar about them, and closer inspection brought gasps of startled wonder from all four observers. Coroner Bogart instinctively looked around the room to see if there were any conceivable instrument or arrangement of piled-up furniture which could make it possible for those straggling marks to have been drawn by a human agency. Finding nothing of the sort, he resumed his curious and almost awestruck upward glance. For beyond a doubt, these inky smudges formed definite letters of the alphabet. 
Letters coherently arranged in English words, the doctor was the first to make them out clearly, and the others listened breathlessly as he recited the insane-sounding message so incredibly scrawled in place no human hand could reach. See my journal. It got me first. I died. Then I saw I was in it. The blacks are right. Strange powers in nature. Now I will drown what is left. Presently admits the puzzle. Hush that followed... Presently amidst the puzzled hush that followed, Dr. Van Keelen commenced reading aloud the worn leather journal. Okay. So that, uh... That was, a. Uh, hold on. That was, a uh, Wing of Death by H.E. Lovecraft with Hazel Held. Um, sorry, that, you know, it wasn't the best reading ever, but I'm just trying to get a playlist that's got all the H.E. Lovecraft books in it. The only YouTube option for this story is a uh, freaking uh like the robot reading it which is like okay but i just prefer human even if it's like you know slightly flawed